It's the final countdown. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lucine. We are coming in with a bonus episode to review AEW All In 2024 from Wembley Stadium. Uh, so I did my previews and prediction show recently. Uh, we are back to a bi-weekly schedule, just so you guys know, during the NFL regular season, because I also do fancy football content. That show is going to be jumping up to three times a week. So for the NFL season, the wrestling show will have to cut back to a bi-weekly episode just so I can keep my sanity and keep up with things. Um, probably we'll be doing like some more top 10 episodes and that kind of thing during uh, the year as opposed to doing any more of the reviews. Um, so I'll probably give the review game a rest for a while. I'll leave that to the professionals. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, content creators doing reviews out there for, you know, all the weeklies and the pay-per-views. So I'm going to back off of that a little bit, actually, I think. Uh, this will be my last review for a hot minute. Uh, and what I'm going to start doing is, like I said, I think I'm going to start focusing more on uh, some of the more generic content, like the top 10 episodes. Uh, so if you guys have any ideas uh, for top 10s, anything you want to see for the top 10, please hit me up. You can hit me up at Jack Lewis now on all my socials, uh, or you can always just send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. All right, so uh, we'll get right into things. I'll try and smash through this review because it is a big one. But we are starting with the London Ladder Match for the AEW World Trios Championship, uh, which involves Christian Cage and the Patriarchy. Bang Bang Gang, House of Black, and the mystery team would turn out to be Pac, Wheeler Yuta, and Claudio Castagnoli, representing the Blackpool Combat Club. Hell of a match. Uh, this was basically a TLC match that involved Christian Cage, so it, you can't go wrong. Uh, I, I thought this was an amazingly fun match. Uh, the one thing that I kept laughing about is Juice Robinson kind of looks like a homeless Bo Dallas to me. Now, when next time you see Juice Robinson, you won't be able to unsee it. But yeah, he looks like Bo Dallas just living out on these streets. Um, Pac obviously got some amazing reactions from uh, the London crowd. Uh, Christian Cage would actually wait and not, uh, he wouldn't come out until mid-match, which was hilarious because of his shtick and his gimmick and his character work that he's been doing. And then uh, you had Killswitch, uh, a.k.a. formerly known as Luchasaurus, at one point going crazy hitting a choke slam party. Just choke slam, or choke slam, choke slam. You get a choke slam. You get a choke slam. Everybody gets a choke slam. So <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, there was a guns up, rear naked, uh, off the ladders through some tables. Uh, there was Juice going to get the huge ladder. So, yeah, it was basically a really fun TLC match with a lot of great spots. Uh, you had Pac, Yuta, and Claudio would end up winning the trios championship, again, representing the Black Bull Combat Club. A little bit of foreshadowing for later in the evening. But before that, we will get to... Mariah May versus Tony Storm for the AEW Women's World Championship. This was low-key one of my favorite matches on the card. Legit. Like, uh, the, the, the match was very cinematic. It kind of actually was the first match that really gave me the feel of, like, oh, this is their big show. Because, like, as fun as the London Ladders match was, that... Uh, 
you know, we didn't even like the TV audience. We didn't even get the full entrances or anything from uh, from the groups. Uh, and I missed the pre-show match as well. So I, I obviously won't be talking about that. Um, but to me, this was like, okay, now we've got the cinematic feel with the, the, the preview and the entrances, uh, especially um, Tony Storm with her entrance uh, accompanied by Luther. Uh, but even Mariah May bringing the, the bloody shoe with her to the ring. So, uh, and then... Mariah Mage is going crazy white hot heel. Uh, she gave Nigel a kiss, which I thought was hilarious, and then she drop kicked Luther and she slapped her own mother. My God, could you be more heel than slapping your mother? I don't think so. And then there was one moment that actually really made me laugh, where they kind of uh, push Aubrey Edwards away by mistake, and they uh, Mariah May goes for a low blow, and then <laughs> I was like. Okay, but then what made it funny was then Tony Storm immediately hit her back with a low blow. So I was like, oh, the double box kick. It was a double box kick. Uh, but it was actually an absolutely incredible fucking match. Like, to me, this was a five-star match. Uh, the ending uh, was spectacular. And the fact that Mariah May went over and was able to pull off the win uh, I thought was incredibly impressive. So just the the whole way that they told the story through the match, and even uh, you know, at one point Tony Storm going to hug Mariah May's mom before she slapped her. I'm a, or I think it was after she slapped her. Sorry. So she went and hugged her mom, uh, holding her to her bosom. The the commentary even said like the way that she would hug Mariah May before. So I I there were so many like wonderful story beats to this match. And this was one of the few matches where I was, like, familiar with the story going in. Like, this is this is what we need more of in AEW, quite frankly. It's, like, as much as, you know, I you want to have a more sports-oriented version of wrestling, it's, like, I feel like you've gone away from that anyways. Let's just get back to telling really good stories in and out of the ring. So this was just a class classic. Um I, and, you know, I know that a lot of people shit on Mercedes Monet and Britt Baker, to be honest. I, whether it was because I was tired or because I had to watch that match in two parts or because even the second time I was a little bit distracted. I didn't think it was as bad as people thought. For the most part, I really enjoyed AEW All In. I didn't have anything bad to say. This was one of those times where I was trying really hard, like, just to be open-minded and not shit on AEW. So we're going to get all of our negativity out right now for Chris Jericho versus Hook for the FTW Championship. Because this was hot fucking dog water bullshit. This was a fucking craptacular match. Like, this is, okay. This was literally the worst. I'm going to get this out. Whoo, daddy. I'm about to make a name for myself. God damn, Chris Jericho is the most delusional fucking cool uncle that's not anywhere close to being cool. That's just fucking like staggering and lingering at the fucking high school parties. Like when you would go to the, the house party in high school and there's always that one weird old fuck that just like, you know, thinks he's the coolest shit at the party, but like doesn't realize that everybody is laughing at him. Like that's Chris Jericho. You need to leave the party, my man. I love you. I appreciate you. You've had one hell of a career. The please retire chants are not fucking ironic, my guy. Like, this new character, it it feels like he's going out of his way now to be cringy as part of the character and thinking, oh, this is going to give me some great heat. There's a huge difference between heat and go away heat. And I never really thought I would say this about Chris Jericho, but this man's got go away heat now. Like the only guy on the entire AEW roster that actually drives me fucking like more crazy than Chris Jericho is Don Callis. Like when you're in Don Callis territory of go away heat, bro. Oh, my God. You got me out here sounding like Vince Russo. Fuck. Like, it's just, oh, it's so bad. Hi, guys. 
Oh, it just, oh, oh, it literally makes me want to rip my fucking ears off. Like, I almost, like, was like, you know what? AEW all in might not be worth it after all, guys. Uh, but no, it's, and then it's to top it all off, this idea that Hook is supposed to be this, like, menacing, cool figure when he looks like a fucking, like, a uh, 14-year-old. Like, I'm sorry. Like, there is no part of me that, believes that hook would just walk into a three-on-one and not get his ass completely beat like i'm sorry the crowd was cheering more for big bill than they were for hook that should tell you exactly where we were at in this match and big bill to his credit looks like a fucking specimen like if the if Big Bill had come out in the role of Hook, that would make so much more sense, right? In the context of the match, but no, the fact that Big Bill is one of the enforcers, and like I mean, Chris Jericho and the other guy looks capable enough, but like Chris Jericho and that other guy, apologies, I don't know his name. Um, uh, he's part of the learning tree. Well, whoever the fuck he is, he's irrelevant right now as long as he's on Chris Jericho Island. Uh, but um. Yeah, Chris Chris Jericho and that guy, like, together fucking with Hook could be believable for him to overcome. When you throw Big Bill in the mix, and again, I get it, it's wrestling logic. There's a, to a degree, I'm supposed to just suspend my logic. But no, where the fuck was Shibata? Where the fuck was Samoa Joe? Where the fuck was any kind of backup until Taz at the very end of the match? When Bill, uh, Big Bill had already been like, uh, Chris Jericho is the one that actually uh, accidentally knocks him through the barbed wire table, and that's supposed to take him out for the rest of the match. I'm like, yo, this man is fucking seven foot fucking, and I've, I'm watching Darby Allen like rise from everything left, right, and center. And you're telling me Big Bill can't get up after fucking ten minutes? Like, come on now, this match sucked. the The only good part of this match was the end. <laughs> when Taz finally had had enough. Taz, when Taz says, I've had enough, he is a representation of the fan base at that point. of like, okay, this is a dog shit match, and we're just going to end it now. I'm going to do my little bit. He hit his little chokey chokey at the same time as uh, Hook in the ring, and uh, Hook wins the FTW championship. Fucking completely irrelevant. I don't even know what that championship means anymore. Fuck this match. Fuck Chris Jericho. Like, fuck Hook, fuck all... Oh, my God. What a horrible, horrible waste of a fucking pay-per-view match on your... On what is, like, your WrestleMania or whatever. Like, this was just... Oh, my God. Unwatchable bullshit is what it was. All right. Let's get back to the positivity, people. AEW uh, World Tag Team Championships on the line. FDR versus Young Bucks versus The Acclaimed. Eh! That's my whole review for you. <laughs> like, the wrestling was really good. This is one of those things of, like, as much as I love the Young Bucks, I don't know if there's necessarily, like, I feel like there's a very select group of people in the back that can tell the Young Bucks no. And I don't know that Tony Khan is one of those people, to be perfectly honest. This is a situation where, for so many reasons, I feel like the Acclaim should have won these belts. And even if you weren't going to go with the Acclaim, you could continue telling the story with FTR. I feel like the only bad decision that you could make here was to have the Young Bucks retain. And I think even... You could have told a more interesting story with the elite themselves if the Young Bucks had lost their championships here. So let's take that aspect of it first, okay? So Okada would feature later in the Casino Gauntlet match. Obviously didn't win that match. But he still has his uh, Continental title. There's so many fucking titles in AEW. It's ridiculous. But he has his. He has a title, okay? So I could see them doing this kind of great character work with Okada, even. Where for a moment, there's like a, a, a glimpse, a moment of hesitation, of regret 
having joined uh, with the Young Bucks, where he sees like, oh, maybe they're not, you know, who I need to attach my ship to, because I just saw them lose their tag team championships. Like, again, just putting in those seeds of doubt for a story you may eventually want to tell with Okada and the Bucks and the Elite. Um, but, like, I really think that the acclaimed needed to win here for a couple of reasons. And the first and foremost, as I talked about on the preview prediction show that I did, was they need it more. Like, FDR and the Young Bucks are so established. Their chemistry, so deep and developed and obvious. It's like every time they're in the ring together, it's it, it's incredible in terms of just like the way that they're able to put their moves together and their, their counters together, uh, the way they put their matches together. Like you could watch a hundred FDR Young Buck matches and, you know, there'll be little intricacies different every time because they are two legitimately, two of legitimately the greatest tag teams of this era and possibly any era. Um, but I again, so to establish the acclaimed as a legitimate tag team, I think this was a perfect moment. A triple threat match with FDR and the Young Bucks. You have all the re- it protects all the teams in a sense because anything can happen in a triple threat match. You could have done a had a situation where you know FDR are about to win and then oh the acclaimed just push them off, get the pin. Or vice versa. Like, there's so many ways of doing that where you get a sneaky win for the acclaimed. But again, this was a situation where I felt like you could have put the acclaimed on the map even more so. Like, they're, I felt like they were the most popular team in this grouping of tag teams. But I, I think you could have really legitimized them. Like, that's the kind of win again, that, like, legitimizes a tag team's career of, oh, we beat two of the greatest tag teams ever at the same time at All In, which is our biggest event. Like, that's, again, that is a resume builder that really would have, I think, legitimized the acclaimed as, like, uh, an even bigger threat as a true competitor in the tag team division. Um and now it's like, yeah, they were, you know, number one contenders and they didn't get it done. And it feels like that's going to be their story um, with Big Daddy Ass on the side. But ultimately, like, I, the there was one spot, a couple spots I really liked. Like, I loved uh, Caster at one point was doing tag finishers. Uh, he hit EVB trigger with one of the Young Bucks and then he hit Shatter Machine with one of the, with one of FTR. So I thought that was really fun and funny. And uh, there was a part where, uh, they were trying to, uh, it was the Young Bucks were trying to use the tag belts or something uh, to cheat. And then uh, Daddy Ass, a.k.a. Billy Gunn, hit a Famouser on one of the tag belts for a uh, close call pin. But ultimately, the Young Bucks would uh, use the title to hit FDR, and then uh, they'd hit an EVP trigger. And kind of just standard paint by numbers, uh, Young Bucks win and retain. Uh, but then you did have the grizzled Young Veterans show up, so that was kind of cool. Uh, and they basically, uh, you know, kind of challenged the Young Bucks, but then beat up FTR. So they kind of set up feuds with both. But again, now who's third wheeling in that situation is the acclaimed. That's where I feel like it would have been even more poignant for the young, uh, uh, young Grizzled veterans to make a debut and attack the guys that just won the belts, a.k.a. if you had gone with the acclaimed there, and you have uh, FTR and Young Bucks leave the ring, and then boom, attacked by Young Grizzled Veterans. Like, that makes so much more sense, right? Anyways, speaking of things that don't make sense, and <laughs> it took me a minute to really wrap my head around the logic of this match, but the Casino Gauntlet match, <laughs> which, <coughs> excuse me, which is um, AEW's version of the Royal Rumble, but it ends in a pinfall or submission. And initially I thought like, well, my initial thought was like, oh, well that's stupid. Like, cause the match could end like with two guys in the ring. Like you could, if you have 20 guys listed for this match and <clears throat> those two first guys go out and that first guy pins the second guy, then you have no more match. 
right? So, like, in theory, I, again, and it's like, some things sound better in theory than they do in practice. So, like, this idea of, like, well, the match could end at any time. Yeah, of course it could end with two guys in the ring. It could end with seven guys in the ring. It could end. So now I'm like, okay, so now you're telling me that you're purposefully booking yourself into a corner in a sense because it's like you have to announce so many people for this match. But knowing that the way that you potentially wrote the outcome, there might only be seven guys that show up out of the 21, right? So it's almost like, do you just not announce the competitors? Is that what it is? Is that why it was a blank thing? Is we don't know who's going to be, and it's just purely speculative who's going to show up. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. Frankly, I think the way you get around it is, and I guess, I don't know if they'll do this down the road, if it ends up turning into like its own pay-per-view, which it could. I think you just do the exact same thing, but as an eliminator. I actually think that would be cool as fuck to have a Royal Rumble, but instead of it just being over the top rope, it's an eliminator match. So like uh, if you get um, submitted or pinned or disqualified should be the other one, actually. There should be no count outs, but if you get disqualified, like if you get caught using a foreign object or, or some shit, like that should count because that would actually add a really cool layer to, to the disqualifications and uh, eliminations, I should say. But uh, I think, you know, I look at a guy like uh, Zach Sabre Jr., uh, who came in at five, and uh, the way that he had so many, like, near pinfalls, like, uh, Zach Sabre Jr. is the exact type of guy that would be, like, really sick to just, like, hit a bunch of crazy, like, sneaky pins on people and, like, get them eliminated uh you know when they're like not expecting or they're fighting someone else or you get situations where you have two guys pinning a a, a a strong contender or something like that like there's again i just feel like there's so many more possibilities i think it also fixes that booking problem of like if we announce 20 people for this match you're gonna see the 20 people in this fucking match like uh you know and you can still keep your surprises it is like a little bit like the Royal Rumble, but differentiated enough that it's your own thing. I think if you did, yeah, I think 20-person Casino Gauntlet Eliminator match. That's what we need. But for the match itself, I really liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, Orange Cassidy came in number one. You had Nigel McGuinness at three. And Nigel looked amazing, I got to say. For a guy who's been sitting on the desk for all this time, he looked incredible, uh, so that was a lot of fun to see. And uh, a lot of guys would just come out like I forgot. Um, I kind of forgot about Kyle O'Reilly, and every he's the Kyle O'Reilly is like the perfect type of wrestler that like I forget about all the time. But then when I see him, I'm like, oh yeah, I really like you. Like his in ring style is he's one of my favorites. Like and then Zack Saber Jr. came out, and I was like, oh yeah, fucking. Zack Sabre Jr. is also one of my faves. Um, Roderick Strong would come out, and then I was just missing Undisputed Era. And that I'm like, okay, now I'm going to go back watch some NXT Black and Gold after this, so I can go back watch some Undisputed Era. Uh, and then we got the Ricochet debut. That was fucking fire. You know Ricochet is going to fit right in uh, at AEW, so I'm very excited for that. Uh, and then at the very end, we got the fake uh, turn from Luchasaurus because uh, he came out with the he came out with the Luchasaurus mask and name, uh, and it made it seem like he was going to turn on Christian Cage who had come out at that point, uh, but instead he choke slams Kyle O'Reilly and puts Christian on top of him. So it was a garbage finish to a great match. There were a lot of better options to uh, give the the future locked in AEW world title shot to, <clears throat> but I understand. Um, I understand where they're going with this. And, you know, this is going to set up a Daniel Bryan versus Christian match where Daniel Bryan can go over. Uh, I, sorry, I'm still, I still call him Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, uh, where he could go over, uh, again, foreshadowing a little bit later in the match spoiler or in the show, spoiler alert. Uh, so let's just get, to it as fast as we can, MJF 
versus Will Ospreay for the AEW uh, International Championship, which uh, MJF had renamed the American Championship. This guy came out dressed like Apollo Creed, the master of disaster. I forget all the other nicknames. Um, anyways. Oh, wait. No, I don't. The Count of Monte Fisto. <laughs> there we go. Um, but yeah, Will Ospreay's Assassin's Creed entrance was fucking dope. This is my problem with AEW in a nutshell. And, you know, you you can tell me I'm wrong. I don't give a shit. You had a 58-minute match on Dynamite or whatever it was, like on your regular show, which is cool as fuck. I do miss the days of, like, title changes on a show. But it feels, it's like you almost could have flipped it but at the same time it's like you i get that like you can't take up a whole hour of a pay-per-view i don't know it's just it, this was hard for me because i feel like coming off what was uh an easy five-star classic uh for their match at dynamite where mjf would win it at the very end um because osprey wouldn't refuse to use the tiger driver which was the that was the other problem was, like, that was the story through this whole match, and it made the ending, like, the most obvious shit. Like, even I predicted it on the pre-show of, like, this is very obviously ending in Will Ospreay hitting a Tiger Driver on MJF for the win, right? Like, that's, everybody sees this coming, right? Um, so, it was still a great match. I still thought it was a, a really good follow-up to that first match. Um, Daniel Garcia would return, distract MJF. Osprey hits Hidden Blade and then the Tiger Driver for the win. Uh, there was also this really cool bit where he tried to hit the Hidden Blade uh, off the edge of the apron and MJF ducked and he fucking, Osprey just took out a camera guy. Um, the crowd was also really hot for this match and for Osprey in, uh, in particular. So like, I'm underselling it a little bit. It was still a great match, but obviously compared to the one that happened on Dynamite, like this was a secondary match, but I I think it was still great. It sets up a, a rubber match because um, <clears throat> Will Ospreay did win and get his title back. Uh, so now obviously you are set up for to do Ospreay MJF 3. Uh, I don't know if they're going to do it sooner or later. Um, they might decide to do it right away. I if it was me, I would actually push it off a little bit, um, kind of let that simmer, let Osprey maybe go do some other things and then come back uh, to MJF. But uh, either way, I think uh, this is just going to continue to be an amazing feud. And then we get into probably the second worst match on the card. But honestly, again, I didn't think it was that bad, but I feel like I wasn't fully invested either at this point. Mercedes Monet versus uh, Dr. Britt Baker. So when I was watching AEW um, All In, I had, first of all, I didn't watch it live. I didn't have time. I had a lot of shit going on uh, this weekend in terms of uh, my channel for like the fantasy stuff. Like I mentioned with the NFL season coming, it's just getting kind of haywire. Uh, my guy, uh, Big Draft Energy, had a 24 hour draft-a-thon going to raise money for palliative care. He had a dead spot from, uh, like, 3 to 6 a.m., so I actually jumped on at, like, I set my alarm for, like, 3.45, and I jumped on at 4 a.m., and I stayed on the stream from, like, 4 to 9 o'clock, uh, and then uh, I had to have my landlord come over, do some minor repairs, and I had to go shopping, just bah, 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 bah. Uh, I had to come back, record another show that night, uh, yeah, it's crazy. A lot. I just had a ton of shit going on. So that's why also this is a day late, uh, is, is this review. But because of all that, uh, I was watching AEW at night and the match where I fell asleep. So maybe that's actually a, a more scathing review than anything. The match that I passed out and I couldn't take it anymore was Monet, uh, Mercedes Monet uh, versus Britt Baker. But then I, the night, like the next day, which would be yesterday now so yeah sunday night i was watching it and then into um monday morning i watched the rest of it during work and uh so again i was partially distracted watching the monet Britt baker match it felt like every time i looked up cool there was like cool spots you know what it kind of reminds me of is like like a michael bay movie or something like that where it's like if you if it's like a two two and a half hour movie 
there's definitely going to be some kind of dead spots where the story fades a little bit because, but it's like, but the action spots are going to be cool. Right. And if you can reduce it to like an hour and a half kind of movie, you know, a movie like Crank, for example, with Jason Statham, where it's like the movie picks up and just never lets you go. And, and it's just full throttle the entire time. Like if, if you're going to do a movie like that, you can't have the dead spots. Right. And that's what this match felt like. It felt like, one of those types of movies where it's like, oh, cool shit happens. Oh, kind of boring 10 minutes. Oh, shit. Cool shit's happening again. Oh, kind of boring five minutes. Oh, really cool shit. Like, um, again, first of all, I love Mercedes Monet as a heel. I think uh, she is an incredible wrestler and an incredible talent and superstar. But as a baby face, I can, I just am never... I hate Mercedes Monet as a baby face. That's all it is. Like, it just get her away from this. The best, the way the best wrestle promos. Like, fucking, that shit was, no. But as a heel, love her. So I love what she's doing. Uh, the stuff with Camilla, I think, is great. Uh, having Camilla as, like, a bodyguard and backup, all of that. Uh, so Mercedes was working the back. She hits the backbreaker, hits the double knees to the back, hits an avalanche power slam at one point. Uh, the Eddie three suplexes. And I know that, again, there were some people saying that Britt was sandbagging her. I don't – maybe I – okay, it could be that. I think, though, it could also just be like if you're coming back from a back injury. And I can tell you guys as someone who struggles with a back injury myself from uh, when I – wrestled and played football at a very low level uh, uh, when I was younger, like back issues are no joke. Just because you're healed and you're back on the road doesn't mean that you can't have flare ups. And if, and it might happen sooner than you think it could be something random that you don't expect. Like, you know, that when, when she, when um, Mercedes Monet hit that uh, sidewalk slam on the turnbuckle, that looked nasty. It, might not have even been that. It might have been when Britt was going for a move and just, you know, the way you the way you lift and twist sometimes, it can be unexpected where it's like you think you're doing the motion properly and then something just – and now it's like, oh, fuck, that hurts. And I got to push through it. But I'm telling you, like, I've been there. It's like you might push through, but, like, uh, I can tell you for sure one of the things that's going to go away is your vertical leap ability. So if someone's trying to give me a suplex and they're needing me to fucking jump and assist on it, I, it's going to be a lot harder for me in that moment. So, again, it's not to excuse what happened, but I just – I I have trouble believing that this was just, like, a Shawn Michaels, uh, Hulk Hogan situation of, like, she was – she's like, oh, I'm not selling for this bitch. I, I don't – and if it is, then that's honestly a bigger – that's a much bigger problem for AEW and, like, representative of, you know, AEW management and that kind of shit. That's way more of an issue if that does turn out to be it. But I tend to – in those kind of situations, I do tend to want to give the person, like, um, reasonable doubt uh, – is like the outcome but that's not what i'm trying to say anyways the there was uh one really cool part where uh brit hit a fucking amazing counter because uh mercedes when they went for another avalanche power slam and brit kind of like turned it into her own power slam it looked really cool so that was awesome uh, and then the ending was well put together it was a destroyer into a curb stomp kick out she hits the lock jaw does Britt Baker, uh, or she tries, but then Mercedes Monet bites her hand as a counter. Uh, she can never fully lock in the lockjaw, which was a story they were telling through the match. And then, uh, you know, uh, Mercedes Monet hits a counter where she kind of pushes her into the ropes, and she kind of, Britt kind of hits her neck on the ropes. And then from that, she's able to hit the Monet maker, which not a big fan of that finisher, but it is what it is. But she hits the Monet maker, and Mercedes Monet wins and retains the uh, what the fuck was this? The TBS championship. Uh, yeah. Anyways, let's just move on. Jack Perry versus Darby Allen for the TNT championship. 
Uh, this this was crank uh, the movie in a match. Like this was 100 miles per hour. This is every Darby Allen match. Um, it might not be the most technically sound, but it's always fun to watch, guys. So I really loved it. Darby came out with the Hellraiser gimmick. He had tacks glued to his face, uh, which looked insane. Uh, and then uh, Jack Perry came out with the body bag. Uh, I will say the one thing that makes me laugh, though, is his, his like, scapegoat mask definitely looks like it got jizzed on. <laughs> Go watch your back, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it looks like he was in the room with Randy Marsh when he finally got internet. I like, what the fuck? Anyways, uh, like I said, this match was 100 miles per hour. Darby comes flying out. Chair shots, tack head, missile drop kick uh, to Perry, who was sitting on a chair outside. Uh, and then he goes for a suicide dive to try and hit Jack Perry into the coffin. Just eats shit. Just straight up, like, launches himself into the coffin. And from there, uh, Jack Perry basically beats the shit out of him. There was one great spot uh, where Perry uh, went and got glass uh in this little bag and then he poured it out uh and you had the cm punk chance and that that thing is to me of like i've never seen a company let one guy live in their head rent free so much like aew and cm punk like it is actually ridiculous uh but then darby would counter with a backdrop into the glass uh and then he would hit uh it's i i think it's cool and it looks fucking gnarly like i would hate to take it as a bump but like the when he does the skateboard onto the back thing from the top rope, like damn. Uh, and then uh, after that, you had Jack Perry would uh, get him on the outside, tape his hands together, really put him in a bad spot, throws him off the stage eventually, puts him in the body bag, puts him in the coffin. There's this great shot where. Um, Darby Allen's trying desperately to get out of the coffin. Like his head comes out of the body bag and he looks like a zombie. And he's trying to drag himself out in the body bag. Uh, but then Perry hits the running knee, closes the coffin. Boom, that's your end of match. Uh, and then the Young Bucks would come out and they start pouring gas uh, on him like they're going to light him on fire. But then the lights go down and we get Sting! He may be retired, but he's still been keeping his eye on AEW, and he has not forgotten his relationship with Darby Allen. So, yeah, he would, Sting would come down, uh, make the save, double Scorpion death drops on the Young Bucks, send Jack Perry running like a scalded dog. Um, and he would pull uh, Darby Allen out of the coffin, uh, and it was a great ending to a great match. Really fun segment. Uh, glad this was the semi-main event. But the reason we were all here, AEW World Heavyweight Championship Swerve Strickland versus Brian Danielson title versus career. To give you guys an idea of how fucking good this match was, people are legitimately asking if this was a better moment for Daniel Bryan's career than the win at WrestleMania 30. I disagree, but it's close. Like, God damn, this was a match. This was a fucking match. This is why I love AEW. This is why AEW deserves to exist and thrive as a company is because they have the ability to put on a spectacle like Wembley Stadium. And this match in particular, Swerve Strickland versus Brian Danielson, title versus career. Brian coming out to the final countdown entrance. Swerve and uh, Swerve's entrance even made him look so legit. Like he looked like every bit the AEW world champion, which is funny because he hasn't really been like necessarily booked that way on like the posters and like a lot of that stuff, but he has been booked that way in ring. Like he's got wins over Osprey. He's got wins over a lot of like major talent. So I, and I didn't realize also Swerve has never tapped out in his career. So that was actually a big caveat that they kind of left out uh, and they didn't really mention it until the end. 
But, uh, yeah, we had uh, Daniel Bryan working the shoulder early, and he had Swerve working the back. Uh, and then uh, uh, what really was a turning point was um, he, Prince Nana kind of went and got the, the ring bell, and they set it up uh, on, the, on the edge of the ring while the ref was distracted, and then Swerve Strickland hit a Death Valley driver on the ring apron, on the bell, it busted Daniel Bryan open. He's immediately holding his neck. Uh, and then he brings him in the ring. He's about to do the stomps. But then Swerve drags him out of the ring, out to in front of his family. And he's doing the stomps in front of his family. And he's there's this moment where he's like yelling at Bree and uh, Dan, uh, Brian Danielson's kids like, you want daddy home? I'm going to send daddy home. You should be thanking me. I'm sending daddy home. And I was like, God damn. God damn. Uh, but then he would, uh, they would go back in and the tie would shift a little bit back to Dan. Uh, Jesus, I keep saying Daniel. But back to Brian Danielson. Uh, he would hit the tiger suplex, the yes kicks, and then the tiger suplex from the top rope. Uh, but then Swerve hit this dirty counter where the and then the medical team would immediately come to check in on uh Brian Danielson, but Swerve sends the medical team running and then he hits a stomp uh and then three house calls and Brian Danielson just rolls the shoulder, just refusing to give up. And then you had uh so there was two really great moments getting towards the end of the match was Brian Danielson's getting kicked by Swerve, and he's staring at his family, and and he's getting hit, and he's going, "I love you." Every time after he gets hit, "I love you," and then it, that uh, that fire up, one of the best uh, face fire ups I've ever seen, fully bloody, you know, making the comeback, and then towards the end also, you had Hangman Page, who. This, this blood feud developing between Hangman and Swerve is just, mm, that, like, that's, again, the kind of stuff I want to see in AEW is everything hot going on in this main event right now. Uh, but Hangman comes down, and it's more of a distraction than they And they do manage to, like, keep him away and out of the match, but it causes such a distraction that da uh, Brian Danielson's able to hit the running knee, and then you get a little bit more back and forth, but then he finally locks in the yes lock, and uh, and then uh, almost into like a, a rings of Saturn. Shout out to Perry Saturn, um, but it was like a combination uh, label lock and cattle mutilation, and Swerve would tap out, and Daniel, uh, Jesus Christ, Brian Danielson would become the new AEW. World Heavyweight Champion, just as I had predicted. There was no way Tony Khan was letting this man leave his company without being a former AEW World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, all the stars, fucking, this match was everything you could want from a professional wrestling match. The perfect cap to AEW All-In at Wembley Stadium, which was a fucking killer show. Like, honestly... Even with uh, the Hook Jericho shit that I didn't really like, and I know that a lot of people weren't into Britt Baker and Mercedes Monet, the rest of this card slapped. So I, I really enjoyed this pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, I, I'll be looking forward to All Out, which will be their next big pay-per-view. But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm just going to super enjoy this, uh, this retirement run for Brian Danielson. He's been one of my favorites. For a long time, um, so I I really appreciate seeing him go on this run. I think this was just a perfect, perfect match to win the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. So uh, very much looking forward to the title run and the eventual actual retirement. But yeah, until then, uh, if you guys want to smash that subscribe button, uh, you know, leave some comments again. If you guys want to hit me up uh, for some top 10 episodes that you want to see, uh, down the line, please, please, uh, don't feel free to hit me up on all my socials at Jack Lucene or send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. But until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled a rise on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm vicious. Kept with the wristics, I read the different potency. Epicetic teens, yo. And with the HMCs, at a short and never speed. Some of the is like, some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Once
Breathe like a 